This is CBC Here and Now. They're all coming back. We're winners! No shit. <laughs> no joke, but lots of smiles for 31 brand spanking new millionaires. Several residents in this beautiful scenic Lark Harbor are now facing a massive jump in their property taxes. Now it's getting to the point there that it's cheaper to go to corner for rent. His car was stolen and trashed, but Ozzy Osbourne's guitarist riffed up some good news. It just seems like people who don't even like don't even know me just care. Well, the front moving in from the east will bring a messy mix of snow, freezing rain, freezing drizzle. It sweeps across the province as we roll over the next couple of days, and I've got all the details coming up. Well, let's get to our top story, the province's newest millionaires. Today, 31 people who all work at the Come By Chance Refinery collected almost $1.9 million each. The $60 million check is the largest ever given out in Atlantic Canada. So what does this mean for the winners? Here's our Peter Cowan. They're all coming back. We're winners. No shit. <laughs> Sherry Moore Hickey had 29 phone calls to make on Saturday morning to let everyone know they were about to become millionaires. For some, it took some convincing. Told silly things like, are you drinking? Or, Is there something wrong with you? These boiler makers work at the Come By Chance refinery. Well, most of them still do. Four immediately retired, but the rest of them are still showing up for work. Before we had the money and stuff and that, each day you get up to go to work with the team that we had in there, you enjoy going to work. So now it just makes it enjoyment a little bit more. The refinery parking lot will look a little different. Many of them have already bought new vehicles. There are new boats, new houses, and lots of money for kids and parents. But with more money comes more problems. The phone calls and social media messages have already started with requests. I've never been a millionaire before, so what do you do? Is it going to be hard to say no when some people reach out and want something? There'll be somebody doing this. We'll, we'll make plans. The prize has also been disputed. Someone contacted Atlantic Lottery to say they're entitled to a share of the winnings. That $1.9 million has been set aside. It'll be up to a judge to decide who gets it. After a whirlwind couple of days, the winners are trying to stay grounded. Health is the most important thing. With the money, it don't mean nothing. You got bad health, well, then, you know, no good. Peter Cowan, CBC News, St. John's. <laughs> now that's a happy looking bunch. Yeah, it certainly <laughs> is. And many of today's winners believe they have one man to thank for their good luck. And it's this guy, Dustin Flight. A few years ago, he won a 50-50 ticket for a fundraiser for a young boy who was battling cancer. And he decided to give the entire $4,000 jackpot to the boy's family. And his union millionaire colleagues thank him for the good karma that paid off today. Oh, he's shedding nice, a tear. Yeah. Oh, that is lovely. Yep. Well, obviously, lots to celebrate for these new millionaires. Most of them from places like Avondale and Harbour, Maine, with just one from St. John's. Uh, what was the mood like, Anthony, when mm -hmm. you were there yourself at that celebration there this really, afternoon? There really was a tremendous feeling. There were so many people and a lot of joy, even for people who are just spectators. A lot of people saying it's better to see the $60 million split among Agree. 31 people than seeing one prize, you know, the entire jackpot go just one winner so I tried to ask them all all 31 of them just where are all these winnings where are they going to go all right here are 31 of the most famous people in Newfoundland maybe the most envied I can't interview them all so I'm gonna ask them for a show of hands all right who's getting a new truck all right uh, snow machine who's going on a trip down south and I don't mean the Buren Peninsula all right who's paying off the house who's getting a new house Ooh. <laughs> Who's helping out their kids? How about the parents? All right. Who knows the song, Take This Job? Never mind. Uh, we wrote it. Who's, <laughs> what was that? We wrote it. Yeah, or some of you are. <laughs> Who is retiring very soon or has? All right. Excellent. And what else should I ask you now? Who's getting a boat? Was that, oh, boat, a boat, a boat sorry. <laughs> right. Who else getting a boat? Any other items? Who's getting more than one truck? Oh, really? And uh, how many trucks are you getting? I'm gonna get two. Two? Okay, what kind? Probably Denali's. All right. Matching? Matching. All right, excellent. Last question for all of you. Who's moving from Newfoundland and Labrador? Nobody! How many of you are going back to work? Everybody! 
Let's say union solidarity, brothers and sisters. Thank you very much. Uh, so much fun, yeah. and the fact that s most of them are going back to work, that's yep. fantastic. They said they have a job to finish, and they're going to finish and they'll make the decision afterwards, but there were so many good stories. There was a husband and wife uh, who were both winners. There were twin brothers who were both winners. Father and son are both winners. Uh, there was one person who, uh, it was his birthday today, <laughs> and it was his wife's birthday the day of the draw. Wow. So, th you know, you get 31 winners, there's so many amazing stories. It was really, you know, if it couldn't be us, yeah. I'm glad it was them. <laughs> well, maybe my next birthday. <laughs> <laughs> great. That was great fun. Well, some people on the West Coast aren't as happy. That's because they're going to see their property taxes double this year. The town council in Lark Harbor says it's for the best, but some residents are outraged. Here now is Colleen Connors has more. About 500 people live here in the last community in the Bay of Islands, but some say they are ready to leave after experiencing a major jump in property tax. Now it's getting to the point there that it's cheaper to go to Cornerbrook and rent. And it's sad, it is a sad time for Lark Harbor. Herod owns a home by the water and a shed on the other side of the road. The town won't combine the tax assessments for those properties any longer. So now Harriet is paying twice the taxes, something she says she can't afford because she has to travel three times a week for her husband's dialysis treatments. That is $365 in gas that's taken away from my husband to travel three times a week to Cornerbrook. So now I got to work longer hours, take extra work where I can get it. 17% of the town's taxed land is affected by this. The town council eliminated the assessment pooling as a way to bring in money to pay bills. We do have a water and sewer project on the go, um, and the tipping fees at the dump are going up significant, significantly come June or July, I'm not sure the exact date. Light and power is going up, just everything is increasing, and we, we've got to pay our bills. McDonald says the mill rate went up last year and council didn't want to raise it again. Upset residents can apply for a tax exemption under the Municipalities Act. The town council says that each resident facing this higher, different property tax is dealt with on a case-by-case -case basis. And the goal here, of course, is to save cost in the long run. Colleen Connors, CBC News, Lark Harbor. It's the world's longest endurance snowmobile race and it happens right here at home. 82 hardcore snowmobilers have descended on Labrador West and they're gearing up for Kane's Quest. That race starts this Friday, but our Jacob Barker is there to check it all out in advance. So Jacob, how's the big race shaping up for this year? Well, Anthony, all 82 of those snowmobiles are lining the arena here in Labrador City now. They're locked down. They've all been checked for safety and that they have everything ready to go when they hit that course on Friday. There are a lot of newcomers in the race, but there are also a couple of champions that are vying to win Kane's Quest. It was an emotional moment last year as Team Maine, Robert Gardner and Andrew Milley crossed the finish line. Both men dedicating the win to their grandfathers who had passed. My grandfather had passed away while we were in the race. So my father, who I do 90% of my snowmobiling with, and my mother, who is obviously a big part of my life, she's my mother, weren't there to be with me. So uh, more than anything, I'd like to win this year just so they can experience that with me. He's back in the garage gearing up for this year. The duo's pulling out all the stops to win the race, but they know it takes more than just being ready to win Kane's Quest. Yes, there is a ton of preparedness. There's a ton of um, scouting and mechanical and, and all that stuff that goes in it. But at the end of the day, man, you've got to have some luck. This year, they're up against the 2014 title holders, Team Aurora, who wasn't in the competition last year. I actually watched the whole thing on an iPhone. It was driving me crazy. Back in the running, vying to take their title back. They're a very competitive team, and we will have to be turning up a notch because I believe this one is going to be, the front runners, I think, is going to be very fast in this one. And though the goal is to make it through the 3,200-kilometer course and cross the finish line first, part of the competition is working together. Yes, they're the previous champions, and yes, we are, you know, racing against each other, but we're friends. We've actually shared a lot of resources for this race because that's the only way you can do it. So no doubt there is a bit there that we will be racing against previous champions, but it's not like you would expect because we're so close. 
And everyone helps one another through and it's been always that way. But at the end of the day, when you're coming home, get out of the way. So while there's a lot of excitement amongst the racers, there's also a lot of excitement amongst the fans and they're in luck because here tonight they're holding a fan appreciation night for everybody to come down, check out the sleds, meet the racers and sure to be discussed tonight. A big topic of discussion will be the weather. Ryan Snodden, I'm sure you know some of the answers of what it might be like on the race course once they hit, uh, once they hit it. Yeah, thanks very much, Jacob. Uh, great stuff there in uh, Labrador City. Uh, nice to hear from you there. And, you know, obviously one of the biggest challenges with Kane's Quest forecast is it's such a long duration event. Uh, so the next week, though, in general, looking pretty quiet across Labrador, which is the good news. No major weather systems. In fact, this is one of the main systems that will be rolling in over the next week or so. And even that is not going to be a big deal in the West where that race is going to be kicking off on Friday. Watch your timeline here. We have snow mixing to some freezing rain, freezing drizzle, and then eventually drizzle as this, this front tracks in from east to west. Very rare to see this, but it will be happening through the day on Thursday. We're going to be seeing that mix for eastern, central, up towards the northern peninsula, as well as southeastern Labrador. Pretty quiet for one last day of prep in uh, Labrador City. This front will continue to track westward, and we're going to be seeing uh, a bit of light snow pushing in and some flurries uh, to Labrador City by the Friday afternoon, Friday evening time period but likely won't be having much of an impact on the racers there, even when it does shoot through with some, uh, some light snowfall across the island. By the time we get to Friday, here comes our northeast flow. And I've been talking about this for the last couple of days. And by the time we get to Friday afternoon, it will be well underway. Uh, we're talking about lots of freezing drizzle and flurry chances along that coastal uh, part of Newfoundland, all the way from St. John's to St. Anthony, even coastal Labrador as well as we get into this very marine air mass and we'll be talking more about that with uh, tonight tomorrow details in full detail and of course your long range forecast coming up a little bit later in the show. Here and now and CBC television faces stiff competition from that other network. Coming soon on here and now the story of the little network that could. I can't wait to bring these stories from uh, from Burgio. In other news, the new federal budget promises to replace the troubled Phoenix pay system, but it won't happen soon enough for some government workers. They gathered outside Finance headquarters in Ottawa today to protest against the IBM pay system. More than 100,000 workers across the country have been affected by glitches in the pay software. Yesterday's federal budget included millions of dollars to repair the problems and eventually replace it. The cost of fixing the Phoenix pay system will soon reach nearly $1 billion. There will be fewer moose licenses for next year's hunt. The provincial government announced the changes late yesterday. There will be almost 2,500 fewer licenses for local hunters. But there's no reduction to licenses for those hunting in zones near the Trans-Canada Highway. The hunting season will be shortened in the eastern management area. That means the closing date for the entire island will be December 31st, 2018. Well, the man who keeps an eye on fuel prices says you can expect to pay more for gas after tomorrow. George Murphy says the latest numbers he's crunched suggest gas will go up by nearly three cents a litre. He predicts it will be the same for diesel and heating and stove oils. The Petroleum Pricing Office releases the actual numbers at midnight on Thursday. The St. John's Edge have secured a spot in the playoffs in their very first season in the National Basketball League of Canada, despite not even being on the court last night. The Edge were practicing earlier today, knowing that they will be one of the four teams in the Central Division to move on to the postseason. Kitchener-Waterloo lost to Halifax last night, meaning the Ontario team has been mathematically eliminated from those playoffs. St. John's will play Kitchener-Waterloo twice this coming weekend. The edge aren't sitting back, though, as making the playoffs is just the first step. We always had a goal. Um, you know, we, we, we knew we were going to make, or we were hoping we were going to make the playoffs, but we, we want to win that championship. So, um, you know, it's nice to know that, you know, our first step is done, uh, which is making the playoffs, but, you know, so we have unfinished business. Well, last night on Here and Now, we profiled all the notorious crime at 74 Springdale Street in St. John's. And one of the incidents that happened there last year involved a pizza delivery driver who, get this, had his car stolen. 
Josh Cook arrived with a pizza, but while he was trying to find out who ordered it, he heard an engine revving. He sprinted to the door just in time to see his car speed off with his phone and large music collection. Now, his car was found a few days later outside the exact same house, but the car was beyond repair. And the only CD left inside the vehicle was one by Zach Wilde, a guitarist who's worked extensively with Ozzy Osbourne. The Zach Wilde's son got word of what had happened. Uh, and the fact that I had mentioned that there was some CD stolen from my car that happened to contain uh, some stuff from like Ozzy, Black Sabbath, Black Label Society, and Zach Wilde solo stuff and whatnot. The story got to him and he, he contacted me and uh, said, you know, I'm Zach Wilde's son and I was wondering, I heard what happened to your car. I was wondering if we could uh, set you up with some stuff and, you know, and I was, well, sure. So he passed me along to Zach's publicist and they sent me a lot of this stuff here, like six t-shirts, three long sleeve shirts, three hoodies, uh, CD, vinyl, and I mean, that was that was just amazing. I, I, I couldn't believe it. There's a few other items in there too. And uh, then a couple of days later, I, was, I come home and there's another package for me and I was, you know, didn't know what it was. And when I opened it up, there's pretty much a couple of a couple of balled up Ozfest t-shirts. And then there was pretty much the entire Ozzy Osbourne Black Sabbath discography. Um, along with, you know, an, an autographed picture. And I mean, that's, to me, it was, it was just amazing considering these guys, they, they don't know me. I mean, you know, I went to Zach's concert a couple of years ago, 2012, when he played under mile one. But I mean, they, you know, they, these guys, they don't know who I am. They just, you know, the story just went viral and they, you know, set me up with all this stuff because it's, I mean, it's amazing. I mean, after all the outpour I had last year, people, you know, saying, oh, somebody should try to go fund me, somebody should do this. Nothing happened, but these guys just reached out and, you know, it's, this is amazing. You know, they're, despite everything I went through, I mean, this is probably the, the positive that came out of it. You know, I'm just, I'm grateful that, you know, somebody out there, it just seems like people who don't even, like, don't even know me just care. I mean, it's, it's unreal. I think he said amazing a few times. Yeah, it is a, a great couple of times. story. Yeah. Ozzy Osbourne gets a bum rap for some people, but nice family sort of gesture there for him. That's great. Larry Wellman's murderer is sentenced in Supreme Court.
Brandon Phillips will have to serve at least 12 years in jail before he's eligible for parole. A Supreme Court judge sentenced him today as members of his family and the family of the man he was convicted of killing looked on. Here and now's Fred Hutton has the story. Larry Wellman's spouse, Linda McBay, witnessed his murder. Today, she was in court to hear how long Brandon Phillips will spend in jail before he can apply for parole. Philip's mother, Deborah, was also in court today watching as her son was sentenced for that murder. Justice Valerie Marshall told the court that while Phillips had no violent criminal past, it all changed in October of 2015 when he tried to rob the captain's quarters hotel. On that night, Larry Wellman intervened. He was shot and killed. The Crown had asked for 15 years without parole eligibility and the defence 10. Marshall settled on 12 years. Linda McBay did not speak to the media, but in an exclusive interview with the CBC, Debbie Phillips had this to say. Well, it could have been 15, but I'm glad we expected probably 10 or 12. And anyway, I'm pleased with that. And I'm just glad it's over for both families. And it's been a hard almost three years for t two of the families. And uh, I'm just glad it's over with now. And Brandon is too. <laughs> During her sentencing, Justice Marshall referenced Philip's age and willingness to rehabilitate, but she also referenced his lack of remorse and admission of guilt. She also pointed to Philip's troubled upbringing, which included watching his father, Eric Squires, repeatedly assault his mother. When Phillips was just eight years old, his father was convicted of murdering a family friend. From there, she said his life went downhill, eventually spiraling into a drug addiction that led to the attempted robbery and shooting. Marshall pointed out several times that even after the shooting, Phillips continued to demand money, even stepping past Wellman as he lay on the floor bleeding to death. In the end, Phillips left the captain's quarters that night without a cent. He was arrested a week later after police were tipped off by Dwight Ball that Phillips may have been connected to the case. Ball's daughter had been in a relationship with Phillips prior to the incident. Phillips said nothing as he was taken out of court. He'll be eligible for parole starting in October of 2027, but also plans to appeal the conviction. Fred Hutton, CBC News, St. John's. There's a big development to tell you about in the case against four people charged in a string of home invasions. More than half the charges have been thrown out of court. Abdi Fattah Mohammed, Gary Hennessy and Mitchell Nippard now stand accused of just two home invasions. Those crimes happened on Angels Road and Milton Road in Paradise over two days last February. The Crown now says it was only Mohammed in the two houses that night, but that all three men helped to plan the robberies. Mohammed is representing himself and has asked for all the charges to be dropped. He says no jury would ever find him guilty. Judge Mike Madden will make a decision on that application next week. Charges involving two other home invasions and the shooting of two dogs have also been dismissed. Identification was an issue, and the Crown says there isn't enough evidence to proceed. A fourth man, Tyler Donahue, now faces just two charges in relation to the final home invasion. It was one year ago this month that a not guilty verdict sparked protests in St. John's. You may recall a Supreme Court decision involving RNC Constable Carl Douglas Snellgrove. He was a police officer who was acquitted of sexual assault. On Friday, the Crown will ask the highest court in the province to order a new trial. Here are now's Glenn Payette reports. No justice, no peace. It's among the most controversial decisions a jury in this province ever reached. Protests broke out after RNC Constable Carl Douglas Snellgrove was found not guilty of sexual assault. When Snellgrove stood trial last February, his lawyer, Randy Piercy, said Snellgrove was a stupid idiot who made a bad decision, but not a criminal decision. Snellgrove, on duty, admitted to having sex with a drunken woman he drove home in his police cruiser. But after several days of deliberations, the jury acquitted him. The Crown believes that Justice Valerie Marshall didn't give proper instructions to the jury and wants Snellgrove to face another trial. The Crown says Marshall didn't make it clear that even if the complainant had given consent and passed out at some point, she could no longer consent. 
Snellgrove's lawyer, Piercy, will argue that the woman testified that she might have been conscious throughout and that Snellgrove testified that the complainant initiated the sex by taking off her clothes and that she lowered his pants. The Crown also says that Marshall should have instructed the jury on an area of consent where the accused is a person in a position of trust, power or authority. To put it very simply, that Snellgrove used the fact that he was a cop to get the woman to have sex with him. In a hearing when the jury wasn't present, Marshall said she wouldn't give the jury instructions on that because there was no evidence Snellgrove used his position to get sex. Here at the Court of Appeal on Friday, the Crown will argue that because of Marshall's mistakes, there should be a new trial. Piercy will argue that Marshall didn't make any mistakes and the appeal should be dismissed and the not guilty verdict let stand. Glenn Payette, CBC News, St. John's. Rain, fog, sleet and snow. Can you put a little sun in your forecast, Brian? Rain, fog, sleet and snow. Come on, warm it up, cause I'm freezing. Singing for some better weather. Brian's up next. forecast has been brought to you by Newfoundland and Labrador Tourism. 5,000 kilometers of groomed trails are waiting to be explored. Embrace winter today.
Welcome back, everyone. Uh, we have something different. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> one to way tell to put you it. about that. Yeah, definitely. So uh, to set it up, a couple of months ago, we were sent a, a video of a local comedian doing a, a bit on stage, a parody song mm -hmm. that uh, involved me and the terrible weather. And uh, we all loved it. And in fact, the bosses here really loved it. Next thing you know, local comedian Vicky Mullally is here at CBC recording the song. And then uh, she was paired with our uh, great cameraman and editor, Gary Quigley, mm -hmm. uh, who his uh, hands are all over this one. Anyway, without further ado, have a look. Around cool northwesterly wind. And I could tell it wouldn't be long till he said it to me. Yeah, me. I could tell it wouldn't be long till he said it to me. Yeah, me. Saying rain, fog, sleet, and snow. Can you put a little sun in your forecast, Brian? Rain, fog, sleet, and snow. Come on, warm it up, cause I'm freezing. I told him, hey. I missed your report today That don't matter, he said Cause it's all the same And when the temperature dips I stock up on storm chips And ask my nan to knit some wool socks for me Yeah, me I ask my nan to knit some wool socks for me Yeah, me Saying rain I can't be mad at you because I know it's not your fault. Also, it helps that you're so handsome. But I need you to stop with all the bad weather, okay? Because I can already tell we'll have another dark and hell. I can't sit in my car without my heated seat. Yes, yeah, seat. I can't sit in my car without my heated seat. Yes, yeah, seat. Saying rainbow. There's only one upside to this weather and it's potholes filled with snow. Brian, warm it up cause I'm freezing. Rain, fog, sleet and snow. Can you put a little sun in your forecast, Brian? Rain, fog, sleet and snow. Come on, warm it up cause I'm freezing. Mustering on Friday, right across the board, dust in that 80 kilometer <laughs> <laughs> Quite something. That was Vicki Malali. She had a lot mm -hmm. of, she had the great idea yep. and then everybody here executed it, yeah. including you. You're getting used to all this yeah. on air singing. I just go with the flow. <laughs> I just, wherever they tell me to go, I go. But uh, yeah, great job by Vicki. And good. of course, uh, again, a uh, shout out to Gary Quigley uh, for putting that all together. Uh, so rain, fog, sleet and snow. That sounds like the forecast over the next Here couple of months. So <laughs> you can let that be your soundtrack. Uh, and in fact, really over the next couple of days what we're going to be seeing is a little mix of everything but first how about this uh, in terms of what we saw from snowfalls monday afternoon through wednesday morning terranova the big bullseye there 38 centimeters they're going to love that in terranova though aren't they debbie uh, 38 centimeters <laughs> yeah uh, indeed yeah uh, long overdue 31 centimeters in gander deer lake at 26 st john's coming in at 24 centimeters and Port of Basque at 15. Now, what's to come? Have a look at this map. Uh, they're talking about, of course, the cold and the snow over in the UK right now because their flow is coming from, well, Russia and the interior. Our uh, incoming uh, air mass is coming from, well, the North Atlantic. And look at this onshore flow. It's setting up all the way from the UK. And there's the warm front right now. And that's the air mass that's on its way. It's going to be moving right across the North Atlantic and into our neck of the woods. Now, of course, it's hitting the cold Labrador current and the Labrador Sea, so it's not going to be quite warm, but it will be not the Arctic air masses that we've been seeing, especially across Labrador. So no deep cold on the way, but no uh, very, very warm temps either. So here's how it plays out. This backdoor warm front moves in 
with snow for tomorrow morning. It will be snowing for the morning commute for St. John's uh, just moving in from the northeast coast into central parts of Newfoundland as well as southeastern parts of Labrador. Temperatures in that minus two to minus four range along the Atlantic coastline. And again, a little bit cooler uh, for you folks in Labrador, minus 20 in Lab West. Now, as we take a look at your timeline for the afternoon, snow will mix to a bit of freezing rain. I think not going to last too long. It primarily is going to be freezing drizzle as the precip runs out pretty quickly on the other side of this front. Uh, and along the coastline is where we'll see drizzle mixed with freezing drizzle. If your temperature is just above the freezing mark drizzle, if it's just below, then it's of course going to be freezing drizzle. Anything that's below freezing uh, will uh, see that uh, drizzle uh, starting to ice up. So expect to do a little bit of scraping, not just tomorrow, but in the coming days. And then uh, as we roll into the southeastern Labrador, that snow will start to track through as well. So all along central and eastern Newfoundland, snow to freezing rain to freezing drizzle, and finally over to drizzle as temperatures get up to around plus one by tomorrow afternoon. Increasing clouds for the southwest half of the island, but yeah, with this uh, favorable flow, temperatures rising to around one, even plus two, with a bit of a sunny uh, breaks in the mix. Uh, there's that messy mix tracking into Labrador as well. Now, in terms of snowfall amounts, we're not looking at much at two to as much as five centimeters. Uh, St. John's up the northeast coast could see some pockets of 10 centimeters through central, but especially through southeastern Labrador. This is where we're talking about five to 10, even some amounts of 15 centimeters by Friday morning up towards Happy Valley Goose Bay and the north coast. Not out of the question here. That front as we roll through Friday, we'll continue to move back to the west, and that's where this onshore marine air mass will really start to uh, sink in. We're looking at lots of cloud cover, chances some flurries mixed with freezing drizzle. That's going to be the name of the game as temperatures hover around the freezing mark everywhere from Nain to St. John's. Not too often do we see uh, just a, uh, especially this time of year, all the same temperatures uh, in terms of that neck of the woods. Now as we talk about the west coast, well not too bad as we will see uh, Corner Brook and uh, the Port of Basque region with a chance of seeing some sunny breaks. We'll break down your long range forecast coming up in just a few minutes. Bro, don't fix it. Tory leadership hopeful Tony Wakem weighs in on the surf clam allocation. As here it now is first to report as possible is now real. 25% of the lucrative Arctic surf clam quota in Grand Bank has been taken and allocated to an indigenous group outside this province. Now critics say provincial liberals are failing to convince their federal counterparts to protect jobs here. 
Tony Wakeham is one of those critics, and he's also running to become the next leader of the Conservative Party. I want to welcome you to here now. Thank you, Anthony. So what's your sense of what's going on here? Well, first of all, I'd like to say I think the federal government does have a responsibility to reconcile with Indigenous groups. But when you try to reconcile with one group and discriminate against another, there's something wrong with that. And this whole process right now is about that. It's about taking jobs out of Newfoundland and Labrador. And that didn't need to happen. I mean, clearly there were options. Why didn't the federal minister sit down with the town of Grand Bank, with Clearwater Foods, and talk about the quota, and talk about, okay guys, we, need to real we want to reallocate some of this, and then have Clearwater still get, go out and fish for right. the clams, have the clams processed in Grand Bank. And they could have provided the royalties right to all indigenous groups in Atlantic Canada, not just one or two or three or four or whatever. But I guess, uh, with all due respect, the federal government's objective is to try to uh, make good with indigenous people. Some, some non-indigenous people are going to pay the price, and isn't that... But it doesn't have to. They, they, they want to provide a source of revenue. I understand that. But at the same time, what we're talking about is where is that going to be generated from? Right. Where is the processing going to take place? This particular industry was built by the people in Grand Bank. They owned that fish plant. They went to Clearwater, turned over the plant to them. They actually loaned Clearwater money to invest in this business. They turned around for the last 27 years and built this industry from the ground up. And that's where it belongs. This is a, an industry of a success story. Yeah, and it's a part of Newfoundland where there aren't a lot of jobs, right? right? And it's, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And so clearly there was options. What surprises me the most, though, is that we have a provincial government who said they've known about this in September. Right. They said they'd be working on it. We have several, a group of seven MPs in Ottawa, and not one of them has been able to stop this at this point in time. Who do you hold more accountable, the members of parliament or the local MHAs? I believe that the provincial government has a responsibility to go after and the seven MPs, and they have a responsibility to make sure they talk to their colleagues right. in Ottawa. And you were just down in that region today, right? But today I was down actually on, on board a trawler that's in dry dock here in St. John's. Again, an example oh. of benefit of an industry benefiting another industry. Right. That boat is tied up here in St. John's being repaired. And I spoke with a gentleman on that boat who's been there since 1994, full-time employment. And he's very proud of that. And now he's concerned that somebody, a federal minister of fisheries, take us away. with a stroke of a pen, will take it away. I want to quickly talk about two issues while I've got you here since you're running for the leadership of the Conservative Party. And that is, Chess Crosby is your opponent. Why are you a better choice than Mr. Crosby? I've spent my life working in public service, serving the public of this province. I've, been, uh, I've worked in the Auditor General's Department, I've worked in several health authorities, and I finished up my career working as a CEO. Mm -hmm. I've been a leader all my life. I've been a leader in the boardroom, I've been a leader on the basketball court, I've been a leader at the office. Right. Basketball so, court too. Absolutely. As president of Basketball Canada, as coach of Memorial Men's University team at one point in time. So I know what it is to build teams. And that's what's going to be important to the PC party. We have to rebuild. All right. Uh, we have to leave it there, but I look forward to seeing you, Mr. Crosby, in the coming weeks. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Missing, a seven-letter word that haunts families searching for loved ones. I always hoped for many, many years that she was going to be found alive. But I know now that's impossible. If she was alive, she would be back to me now. That's, that's the only thing that tells me that something's happened to her. I'm Arianna Kelland. Last Seen is a new series on CBC Newfoundland and Labrador. Seven cases, seven people who vanished. Hear their mysteries starting March 6th on Here and Now, cbc.ca slash nl and our YouTube channel.
It is time now to meet our young athlete of the day. We'd like to introduce Casey McFatridge. Casey is four years old, it's from Freshwater. She trains with Foley's Academy of Martial Arts and just took home a gold medal in her first competition. Very nice, nice looking medal and a nice looking Casey. She also enjoys ballet, gymnastics, figure skating, as well as soccer. Wow. Sounds like a pretty <laughs> busy time keeping up with you, Casey. Congratulations on being chosen as today's Young Athlete of the Day. The weather update is brought to you by Bell Tone Hearing Service St. John's. Helping the world hear better. Well, you heard from Ozzy Osbourne's guitarist. It'll be the next musical inspiration for uh, you. Somebody singing you know, an Ozzy uh, rip-off song. Yeah. But <laughs> yeah. Oh. Possibilities are endless Crazy there. Crazy yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Talking about uh, possibilities of snowfall, we haven't uh, had a whole lot until recently, and you've been crunching some numbers? That's right. Uh, and you know what? As we take a look at... Uh, Back over the last couple of days, we can compare it to uh, what we had over the past month or so. Have a look. So these are on the left, our numbers for basically the past month. January 21st to February 23rd, St. John's only picked up 36 centimeters of snowfall over that month span. Over the past four days, yeah, 36.6. So we've in four days matched what we had in the month before that. So if your back's a bit sore, it's because you're out of shape. You haven't been shoveling enough. Now I did uh, look at run the numbers uh, Gander and also the West Coast, not quite uh, this even. Uh, Gander picking up around 50 centimeters uh, in that uh, month prior to what you just had, which is of course in that 30 to 40 centimeter range for you folks along central and the northeast coast as well. Uh, now the west coast of course has been seeing uh, a little more in the way of snowfall there as well. As we move forward, not a lot of snow in the forecast. As I mentioned earlier, we do have that burst coming in uh, right now uh, tonight into tomorrow with five to as much as 10 centimeters for places like central parts of Newfoundland. After that, it really shuts down in terms of the snowmaking potential thanks to a big blocking high setting up and uh, that high will keep this very potent storm to our south. At least that's the way it appears. This is going to be a big storm for the northeast parts of the U.S. They've been pulling their hair out trying to figure out where the heaviest snow will be. It appears it will track through northeastern parts of the U.S. Some coastal flooding possible uh, with uh, storm surge and some heavy rains as well. That'll be one you're likely going to be seeing on some of the national news wires. As we take a look at the timeline here in terms of our neck of the woods, while the blocking high sets up, it's forcing this front to move from east to west, which is very rare indeed. You see that snow changing to some freezing rain and freezing drizzle by the time we get to Thursday. Uh, temperatures on uh, Thursday evening, that is temperatures above the freezing mark. Uh, most areas right along the coast or at least at the freezing mark. And I think we will see once again, like we have seen today, fog along the northeast coast, and that is going to continue to be the game the name of the game right into Friday as that northeast flow will be relentless. And so flurries, freezing drizzle chances, some coastal fog, even up towards the northern peninsula as well. And then as we roll into the Saturday time period, that front dissipates, the onshore flow sticks around. Saturday, Sunday, it's a very similar setup here, even into the Monday time period. And there's that big coastal storm. Uh, looks like it will remain well to our south. That will keep our weather pretty quiet and very, very, you remember, basically the story of the winter has been the roller coaster rides we've been seeing. Well, the roller coaster is hitting a bit of a flat stretch here where basically temperatures are the very, very same around the freezing mark over the next seven days. Marine air mass basically parked over us and uh, that onshore flow from the North Atlantic will keep our temperatures capped near zero. Flurries and freezing drizzle chances, as I mentioned, uh, with some sunbreaks along the west coast, shielded from that northerly flow. Even eastern Labrador, very mild for this time of year. Western Labrador, a bit of a mild push on the menu for you folks, as well as some sunny breaks in the mix, too. That's your forecast tonight. Debbie? Thank you very much, Ryan. Well, in national news, it is the day after Bill Morneau tabled his third federal budget. Within the 300-odd pages is a national pharmacare plan that could have a big impact on Canadians. But apart from setting up a new federal advisory council, there have been very few details. CBC's Susan Lunn explains. 
The federal finance minister was owed today making a sales pitch for yesterday's budget. Bill Morneau says people are asking about the new National Pharmacare plan. The advisory council has a year to make it all work, but Morneau already has an idea of what he wants them to look at. There are parts of the system that are working well. There are parts of the system that really aren't working well. Uh, we need to consider both those parts. I think what you'll see the committee do is take a look at how we can ensure that all Canadians have access in a way that's fiscally responsible. It's that caveat that has people wondering just what kind of national pharma care plan the federal government plans to bring in. Quebec already has its own plan that covers people without private health insurance. Ontario too has its own plan that offers drug coverage for everybody under the age of 25. Morneau today spoke about how the workforce has changed, that people often find themselves in a job but without health care benefits. And the finance minister says his plan will be designed to fill in those gaps, not to offer prescription drugs for every Canadian that already has an existing drug coverage plan. The Advisor Council's report will be delivered a year from now, just months before the Liberals go to the polls to ask the public for a second mandate. Susan Lunn, CBC News. Ottawa. And now to the U.S. It is back to class for students at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Florida. On Valentine's Day, a gunman opened fire and killed 17 people. Today, students went back for half the day. I want to say we didn't talk about it because we did, but, you know, we were just trying to reinstill the sense of normalcy that we all, you know, had before this. Because at the end of the day, you know, life has to go on. Students began their day with 17 seconds of silence and placed flowers on the desk of victims who will never return. Armed police were also present on the first day back. Students who don't feel comfortable returning to the school will be able to finish their year online. There are more concerns over the endangered North Atlantic right whale. Scientists counting the number of births this season say they haven't seen any new calves at all. In recent years, an unusually high number of dead whales have been found on eastern Atlantic shores. And there are fresh questions about what the federal government is doing to protect the species. CBC's Brett Ruskin has the details. To accurately assess a population, scientists have to look at the deaths and the births. We know already about the deaths. At least 18 North Atlantic right whales have been found dead off North American coastlines since around the summertime. Now, the births, the scientists embarked on their annual calf count to count the number of calves or new baby whales that were born this year. In the last few years, usually it's been around 20 to 25 new babies. Last year, it was only five. This year, zero. No new baby calves have been spotted by scientists, which is extra concerning. Again, coupling the high death rate with the low birth rate, scientists are concerned. Now, again, the government here in Canada has taken a couple of steps to try to protect the whales when they do migrate north and come into the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Uh, changes to the fishing gear around the snow crab industry, shorter lines, uh, more vertical lines as opposed to the horizontal ones that often ensnares and entraps whales. Also, color-coded lines and mandatory reporting of any lost gear. Overall, though, it looks as if, especially with this new news about the low observed Observed birth rates for the North Atlantic right whales that they may be in more trouble than we previously thought. Brett Ruskin, CBC News, Halifax. Well, this picture is uh, whew, one of the best we've seen in a couple of days. I mean, every day is great, but this is a special wow. picture. Is that uh, Kyoto? <laughs> <laughs> uh, sunrise. The corner of one of the corners of this province. Uh, I know that's probably a pretty big clue. Big clue. Yeah. Big in the sense that it's no clue. Really? One of the corners oh, of the corners. One of the corners of this province. Think about that. You gave it away. Did I give it away now? I, I think so. Yeah. Anyway, I don't know. We'll Am reveal I the only after one the break. Who doesn't? <laughs> it's
Welcome back once again. Well, it was a spectacular ending for some decades old smokestacks on the shores of Lake Erie. Nanticoke Generating Station, Ontario. Demolition of those landmark twin chimneys built in the 1970s marks the end of an era in many ways. This station was once North America's biggest power plant and it stopped burning coal in 2013 and was later shut down. And uh, the plan now is to build a 43 megawatt solar farm on the site. Sign of the times, hey? Mm -hmm. yeah. I think they'd be doing a lot of dusting in Nanticoke after that, right? <laughs> That's right. Do the wow. windows. <laughs> uh, quickly to our viewer picture, then to our colors yep. uh, for tonight. Uh, have a look. I think I threw some people off, including Anthony, when I said one of the corners of the province. I can, would consider Cape Race one of the yep. corners of this province. You're right. The southeast corner. And a beautiful shot there from lighthouse keeper Clifford Dorn, who's oh. a frequent contributor. Gorgeous. And that was the sunrise this morning. Imagine how many beautiful sunrises he's seen in his line of work. For sure. Gorgeous. Right. And how many he hasn't. Yeah, true. Yeah, with all the fog. <laughs> yeah. True. So, uh, we're wearing pink today. Pink, that's right. Anti-bullying. Stand up for it. A lot of people in and around wearing pink today to, to stamp out bullying. I didn't have a pink shirt. I feel kind of... Uh, well... You know, Sorry, and you didn't you have made the same. Rest, but, anyway. but we all, of course, uh, are right behind that cause. Yeah, so. absolutely. Thanks so much for joining us, everyone. Have a great night. See you tomorrow. Good night, everyone. Bye now.